You're listening to the Deerfield Public Library podcast, March 22nd, 2023. I wanted to be in a room talking to people about books. Hi, I'm your host, Dylan Zavagno, Adult Services Coordinator at the Library. And on this episode of the Deerfield Public Library podcast, I'm really happy to share a conversation with Merve Emre about the work of a writer we both adore, the acclaimed, the beloved 20th century Italian writer, Italo Calvino, known for genre-defying stories and novels like Invisible Cities and If on a Winter's Night, A Traveler. Merve Emre is herself an acclaimed and sought-after writer. She's a contributing writer at The New Yorker, associate professor of English at Oxford University, and currently a distinguished writer-in-residence at Wesleyan University. She's the author of several books, including Paraliterary, The Making of Bad Readers in Postwar America, and The Personality Brokers, and Books of Group Criticism, The Ferrante Letters, and Once and Future Feminist. Merve is also the editor of The Annotated Mrs. Dalloway. Her essays and criticism appear in places like the New York Review of Books, Harper's, The Atlantic, the London Review of Books, and more. Merve's recent essay in The New Yorker on Italo Calvino appeared just a few weeks ago in the March 6th issue in print under the title Marvelous Things and online as The Worlds of Italo Calvino. Well, here at the library over the last two months, I led a book discussion on two Calvino novels, and we jumped at the chance to talk to a fellow appreciator. We talk about some of the themes of Calvino's work, but also of Emre's work, and appropriately, given the author we're discussing, it's a conversation about literary conversation itself, and even how Calvino's utopia might help us save the literary world. Here's my conversation with Merve Emre. We're here to talk about Italo Calvino, an author we both love, the subject of your recent essay in The New Yorker in the March 6, 2023 issue. Calvino was born in 1923. It's his centenary year. And there is a new book of his essays translated from the Italian by Anne Goldstein, The Written World and the Unwritten World. And in the book discussion I lead at the library, we had nearly 20 people reading over the last two months Invisible Cities and If on a Winter's Night, A Traveler, along with some Cosmic Comics and some essays. So, Merve, over the last few months, I went back and read nearly all of Calvino. I couldn't stop myself. (laughs) And then I also was reading all of Merve Emre, and I found, well, maybe a million connections between the two of them. <laughs> so I thought I would start um, by telling you a couple stories, because in your criticism in your books, you sometimes resort to telling a narrative about reading. Mm. So I'm thinking of Ferrante Letters or um, in the Annotated Mrs. Dalloway or even in Once in Future Feminist in a very different context, you say, to appreciate all this, we need narrative. Mm -hmm. So here are my two stories. First story is I'm a senior in high school, and I'm traveling with friends for spring break from Chicago to New York. It's my first time going to New York, first time traveling just with friends, not on a school trip or something. And I'm staying with a friend a year older in her first year dorm at NYU, And I was just astonished to be in New York City where all these books I had read took place. And I have all these bookstores around. And where else do I go but the Strand? And I see on a table, if on a winter's night, a traveler. And I opened the first page. And it said, you are about to begin reading, if on a winter's night, a traveler. And, you know, I had read from my dad's bookshelf all the postmodern <laughs> classics, Nabokov and Pynchon and DeLillo. But this book, when I read that, I thought, can you do this? Had no one done this before? <laughs> it was like the ur text of like metafictional fiction or something. 
And I took that home and I have this memory of reading in this dorm to like three in the morning and I could smell the dishes. Then I would read in the courtyard and the cigarette smoke in the courtyard. And it just cemented in me. This is a book that was addressing me directly as a reader. And it didn't stop addressing me. And I was just obsessed. Okay, now story number two. Can I can I interrupt? And please, ask please. <laughs> Were you in love with the person you were staying with or was that truly a friend? No, that was truly a friend. Just curious. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a good question to ask. <laughs> um, so story number two, I'm 24 now and I'm in the most Calvino-like of cities, Venice. And it's my first time in Venice, and I've graduated college a couple years earlier. I didn't know what to do with my life, so I took a personality quiz. It was not the Myers-Briggs that you've written about, <laughs> um, but it was uh, what color is your parachute, a kind of— uh, I know that one, yeah. Yes, <laughs> book to help you figure out what your career. And you do all these things. You winnow down. You write different journal entries, and you come to this thesis statement, and I said— I want to sit in a room and talk to people about books. And I was on this trip. I was sitting on a canal with my legs dangling over. I was with my dad. We had just eaten fried anchovies. And I was desperately telling him, I want to sit in a room and talk to people about books. What does that mean? Does that mean being a teacher? Does that mean being a professor, a literary critic, a librarian? Somehow, both of these moments started me on a path that has led me to doing a library podcast. So tell me, Merve, how did you first encounter Calvino, and is he as central to you as I suspect he is? <laughs> oh, what a, what a beautiful set of stories you've told. It's interesting to me how after my essay came out, I started getting many messages and emails from people who had similarly vivid recollections of the first time that they encountered Italo Calvino, and in particular of the first time that they encountered, if on a winter's night, a traveler. I think the reaction that you describe is a very common reaction, which is, can you do this? And if you can, <laughs> <laughs> How could anybody stop themselves from reading it? My Calvino memories are situated in my life at around the same time that you describe, or rather, I think it's a time sort of in between both of your stories, which is I had graduated from college I was working at my first job, which was as a management consultant at a big consulting firm called Bain and & Company. And I had a job offer in Boston at a private equity firm called Bain Capital. And I went on a visit and I ended up falling in love with someone that I met there on this visit. And he gave me first The Baron in the Trees, and then he bought me my first copy of If On a Winter's Night, A Traveler. The reason I asked you whether you were in love with the person you were visiting is because the other common strain that has come out of a lot of the stories that people have sent to me or told me about their encounter with If On a Winter's Night, A Traveler is that they were invited not only to see themselves in the you that is addressed, but to find the person in their lives who was the other reader to their reader, which was very much the story of how I came to If On A Winter's Night. And for me, the real upshot of that story has nothing to do with the person uh, because it didn't work out. But at that moment, I think I had a very similar realization to the one that you described, which was that I did not want to spend my life in an office trying to figure out how to help make companies who already had lots of money more money. I wanted to be in a room talking to people about books. And it was when I was happiest as an undergraduate it was the activity that made me happiest outside of work when I graduated from college. 
And I thought, well, I have this job offer, but I don't have to take it. And I decided to apply to graduate school in literature, in English literature. And I remember in my statement, I wrote about Calvino and how I wanted to work on Calvino, which is, you know, both inappropriate for applying to an English department and also <laughs> not at all fashionable or professional. But he is very much, I think, the reason why I do what I do today. And it was nice to find my way back to him through this essay. That's wonderful. Well, it's quite a thing for a critic to say, as you say in your New Yorker essay, Italo Calvino was word for word the most charming writer to put pen to paper in mm -hmm. the 20th century. I think that's um, true. I really yeah. can't. Think of, I mean, and there's a little joke in there, right, which is that later on in the essay, I say, oh, when I'm reading If on a Winter's Night a Traveler, producing a kind of reading of If on a Winter's Night a Traveler, I say, to issue any judgment about a literary work, to call it the best or the worst, or even the most charming, is a judgment that is made against a backdrop of deep and humbling ignorance, because you can never have read everything such that you can actually make a judgment like that. So there's a little kind of joke buried in that in that claim that if you read to the end and go back, you'll you'll see. Well, I think we're going to encounter a lot of uh, jokes and desires as we go through this conversation. <laughs> so I think we'll bracket Invisible Cities and If on a Winter's Night, a Traveler for a moment. Sure. And I thought I would just ask, because I'm sure there were Calvino stories or moments you couldn't get to in the limited length of a New Yorker essay. So mm -hmm. I thought I would just kind of ask in your rereading, uh, what surprised you or anything that stuck out or any other moments of extreme charm that you found? Well, while I was rereading Calvino, I was reading for the first time uh, Ariosto's Orlando Furioso, which, wow. is, <laughs> which is Calvino's favorite book. And I hadn't read the earlier Calvino. I hadn't read much of the earlier Calvino. So for me, it was my first time reading The Cloven Viscount and The Non-Existent Knight. And I, because I was reading Ariosto at the same time, it became very clear to me how much of the early Calvino is really just taken from Orlando Furioso. He takes these wonderful plot lines that you find in Orlando Furioso, and he updates them in his way, which isn't to say that he transplants them to the 20th century or anything like that. He very much retains their medieval settings, but he brings to them a kind of modern sensibility, a modern language, a modern tolerance for humor, especially bodily humor that I found absolutely fascinating. And in doing so, he shows us something that was always already present in Ariosto. It's a deep and loving, ironic attachment to the tropes or the motifs of romance. So that was really quite surprising for me. And I don't think I would have fully realized the extent to which he was doing it had I not been reading Calvino alongside Orlando Furioso at exactly the same time. Oh, that's fascinating because, you know, I think he was part of the Olipo group. Olipo, yeah. yeah. Yes. But I think you joined some other people in saying that we really should be connecting him to this earlier work. It was my first time reading The Non-Existent Night as well, and I couldn't get over this moment mm. where it's, it is a non-existent night. It's like an empty suit of armor. <laughs> yeah. His name is Agilouf, and at one point, he's in a battlefield, and he sees corpses, and he envies the corpses mm. because at least they get to exist. And there's this sort of, like, envying of bodily form that happens over and over again in Calvino. Mm. Well, and Agilouf, I mean, what's so interesting to me about Agilouf is that he even though he doesn't have bodily form, he has a very interesting kind of historical or technical memory, 
So he can tell you everything about the hierarchies of the knights that are on the battlefield. And when, I can't remember who it is exactly that sees him practicing his moves <laughs> in the field, he has absolutely perfect technique. And then the scene that I can never get out of my mind, which comes toward the end, is the seduction scene when Agalef goes to the castle and he has, or he spends the night with Priscilla, the lady. And they're in the same bed together, but all they're doing is talking. He's this master of courtly speech of, of what in medieval romance was called Luf talk, L-U-F. And that's why it's kind of funny that Luf is attached to the end of his name. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so he is in the bedroom with Priscilla, speaking to her in the way that courtly lovers did. And she is in complete ecstasy. He's not touching her at all. And then in the morning when her ladies come in and ask her what happened, she, oh, Agalef, what a man, what a man. And so, you know, it's taking us to this time when, yes, there is this mourning for bodily existence, but on the other hand, the power of the right words put in the right order could have something akin to a bodily effect on people. That's the great romance of the magic book, of the witch who casts her spell, of courtly love, that the words in and of themselves would be enough to change something about the way our bodies reacted to or perceived the world. And that's what I absolutely love about Calvino. And that's what I think the, the kind of core fantasy is that he brings to all of his books, really from, from the Our Ancestors trilogy to Mr. Palomar. Wow. Um, I, it's, it's making me think of Cosmocomics, everything yeah. you're saying. And, you know, this wonderful story, The Distance of the Moon, where these characters are can go back and forth between the moon because, of course, the moon used to be much closer to Earth, and they would just have to go up a ladder a little bit and turn around, and then the gravity of the moon would pull them in. But as the moon is going away farther and farther, there starts to be this grief that you can't have that connection anymore. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is the, the longing and the grief that permeates much of Calvino's work, although you start feeling it more toward the end of his life, that the organic connection between these two worlds or these two realms, whether it's the realm of the earth and the realm of the moon or the realm of the, the word versus right. the realm of the nonverbal, that that organic connection has been severed or the distance between those realms just keeps growing and growing and growing. And that all of his fiction is trying to find a way to bring them back into a kind of relation that is on the one hand, completely utopian in its imagination, while on the other hand, never letting us forget that that connection has been severed and can really never be recovered, or it's only perhaps in fiction that it can be recovered. And it takes a particularly fantastical kind of fiction to stage that recovery. I wonder if this is a point to maybe consider Calvino's politics because I found this so interesting. He was a committed communist and then left the party after the Hegarian uprising was squashed in 57, but sort of maintained sympathies, but also really aligned himself with literature. That's almost where he found his politics. I don't know if you read the story, The Watcher. I became very obsessed with the story where yes. it's about a poll watcher who yes. is part of the Communist Party and he's going to this hospital for the sick and infirm and has to help decide, are these people well enough to vote? And mm -hmm. all of these questions about the universality of democracy come into play. And at, at one point, he needs to read so badly, this poll watcher, to get some some literature for himself. That is that is the Turkish novelist Orhan Pamuk, ah. also a big fan of Calvino, 
recently told me that that is his favorite Calvino story. And it's the one that he teaches in his class on fiction. Oh, and wow. So we had just, yeah. just been talking about that. Gore Vidal he, loved that story too. That was his. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and I think I mentioned this in my piece, but he writes to, to Pasolini, he writes this letter where he says that he feels like the intolerance of the left is such that he finds it more objectionable to support their current political regime than he did to oppose the fascists. And that is a wild statement to make, a truly wild statement to make in my mind, or an, an incredibly aggressive one. And I think that there is a retreat into the literary as a place of a kind of humanistic, universal right. fantasy. But I don't know if I would say that he is ever apolitical. I, I think, um, you know, at the very least, there is a deep horror of war and a real desire for pacifism that's running through a lot of the fiction. And then I think that, I mean, I think you even see that in Cosmocomics. There's a real suspicion of certain forms of tribalism, of us versus them thinking. I can't remember which story in Cosmocomics it is where there's a tadpole-like figure who finds this woman that he loves, but his uncle is in the water, and there's this division between the kind of between amphibious life that still lives in the water and amphibious life that has like made it onto land with one thinking they're more progressive than the other. But that story seems to me to be a kind of wonderful send up of our ideas about technological or evolutionary progress and how those lead us, whether in our own families or across the world, to certain forms of division and conflict. So, you know, I think he makes the statements that he does about retreating to this realm of the literary, but I think it would be wrong for anyone to believe that that can be disentangled from politics, and ultimately it, it really isn't in his fiction. Right. He said about um, Baron in the Trees that it was, he was trying to demonstrate the problem of the intellectual's political commitment at a time of shattered illusions. Yeah. And, you know, of course, the Baron is also a reader. And... <laughs> Right. Well, the Baron is a great model of what is often called a traditional intellectual as opposed to an organic intellectual. So if the organic intellectual emerges from and is very much bound to the protocols of a particular class identity or a particular class location, the traditional intellectual is one who transcends those kinds of divisions. And what's so interesting about the Baron, what's so interesting about Cosimo, of course, is that, you know, he's an aristocrat, but through literature, the people that he ends up befriending are the thieves that steal from the estates of the aristocrats in order to redistribute the food to their people. And to me, one of the most moving moments in the Baron in the trees is when Cosimo makes friends with the thief De Brugge. Yeah, Gian de Brugge. Yeah. Gian de Brugge, yeah. And, and Gian de Brugge and Cosimo become these reading buddies. And they are reading Richardson's Clarissa together. <laughs> or Cosimo has given de Brugge Clarissa. And de Brugge becomes such an avid reader that he becomes a kind of lackluster thief. And when his buddies try to get him, to rob a house or something. He does such a bad job that he gets caught. And the Baron climbs up to the tower where he's being held and sits outside of his prison cell, outside of his window, and keeps reading Richard, keeps reading Richardson to him, right? He keeps reading Clarissa to him. And the great tragedy of De Brugge's life is that he might die without learning what the ending of Clarissa is. 
And he, so as he's being he hanged, he he uh, tells the Baron, "Tell me how it ends." How and it he ends. says, "I'm sorry to tell you, Jonathan ends hanged by the neck." Thank you, like me. Goodbye. It's so. Funny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I I I think that there's something very beautiful about that. There's there's also a fantastic essay that I didn't talk about that's in the new collection. Uh, that's in the new collection, the written world and the unwritten world, that meditates on what we lost when we stopped having a kind of prehensile use of our feet. Mm. Let me just find the essay because it's, okay. uh, it's, it's uh, you know, you have to read it alongside the Baron in the trees, but you also read it, I think, alongside Calvino's commitment to bringing the body into the world and to making things with the body and to using different parts of the body to explore mm. the world and a kind of commitment to craft. Let me see if I can find it. But you keep asking questions while I see if I can find this essay. Um, oh, well, I want to uh, turn to Invisible Cities, but if you, yeah. No, no. Okay. Let's turn to Invisible Cities. I'll so let's turn to Invisible Cities. It's sort of a very strange book. It's a series of prose poems. They're sort of one to three pages and mm -hmm. descriptions of these strange cities. Some are underground, some are above ground, some are made of nets, or some are, you know, maybe in a different universe. And it's the explorer Marco Polo telling the emperor Kublai Khan about his realms. But mm -hmm. I love that you focus on, it, it came out in our discussion where all of a sudden we realized <laughs> well, wait a minute, he's not even speaking. He's just sort of gesturing, putting different objects in front. You You realize for most of their dialogue together, they're actually not sharing a language. Mm. Yeah, and, and then it raises the question of who is speaking here? So when we have, and, and maybe one thing to just flag is that we have this interesting alternation between the sections of invisible cities that are italicized and that are being narrated to us through a third person narrator. And then we have the actual descriptions of the cities themselves. And the question that we have to ask once we learn that neither is really speaking to the other or capable of understanding the language in which the other speaks is who is speaking here? <laughs> whose mind, whose voice, whose idiom do these descriptions of the cities come from? That is the mystery that in many ways is never really solved throughout Invisible Cities. And I think that what we are supposed to believe or what Calvino's utopianism would have us believe is that this is the meeting of both of their minds, that it is where Marco Polo and Kublai Khan's minds and our minds right. <laughs> meet in between the production of these gestures through these objects and the deciphering of what those gestures mean. And to me, that's very similar, and maybe it's even more explicitly stated in this way in a book like The Castle of Cross Destinies, where the tarot cards, where tarot cards, a deck of tarot cards is being laid out and resulting in that same kind of communication slash deciphering that doesn't exist really in anyone's mind, but is a product of everyone's imagination. Right. And I think this is where we found, you know, the sort of positive aspect of his politics that he's giving, he's always giving it back to the reader and that the power is in you to create the meaning out of it. And you say, um, as you were just stating, that this sort of fear of misunderstanding runs through a lot of these novels, but that his utopianism offsets it. Mm -hmm. So I have to tell you, we tried to be these utopians as a book discussion. And I'm just going to tell you our reading here because it was so delightful. So, you know, there was a lecture that Calvino gave at Columbia University in 1983, 
And he says, well, of course, people are going to look at the very end of Invisible Cities. And there's this line, you have to seek to learn and recognize what, uh, who and what in the midst of Inferno are not Inferno and make them endure, give them space. He says, well, of course, we're going to look at the end. But this is sort of a symmetrical book. It has a weird form to it. The chapters are numbered oddly, and all these different types of cities are woven together. So he says, well, maybe we have to look in the middle. The -hmm. middle city is uh, Baucus, I'm not sure how you say it, a city of the void. But then he ends the speech by saying, well, You know, I'm just one reader among others, but I might say chapter five, which develops a theme of lightness and is associated with the theme of the city. There are some pages I consider the best as visionary evidence and perhaps the more slender parts, the thin cities or others are the most luminous. So we kept thinking. Oh, he's playing. I mean, but this is a joke. Totally. Yeah, Yeah, of course. Of course, yeah. But we took it seriously and we (laughs) said, well, let's go to the very middle page. We're going to go to page 82.5 and find... (laughs) Um, a description of a bridge's arch made of stones, or are, do the stones make the arch? Is the arch the thing, or are the stones the thing? We added the 55 stories to the 11 sections to get 64 pieces of a chessboard, which is an image of multiplicity. We went to page 64 and found the word chessboard on page 64. <laughs> This is like, do you know, it's funny, I just watched the two original National Treasure movies with my kids. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and this is this is like reminding me a little bit of Nicolas Cage. <laughs> Nicolas Cage walking around being like, but then, you know, 1676, <laughs> Benjamin Franklin, and if I put these glasses on, and if I'm going to steal the Declaration of Independence, you know? I mean, I think he... You know, like this, this is what's so wonderful about this kind of reading. So, so on the one hand, there are people who would say, well, this is kind of classic paranoid reading. Yeah, so it didn't work for some people in our, in our right, group. Right, right. Sure. It's, yeah. kind of it's the kind of reading that a novelist like Thomas Pynchon is yes. joking about when he gives us Oedipa, Oedipa Moss, you know, yes. looking chasing down marvelous words in Jacobean texts. And some might say, well, this is classic paranoid reading and its function is, you know, to distract us from the task at hand, to send us sort of spiraling into this abyss in which everything is unknowable or indeterminable. And the flip side to that might just be to say, what a way of being attached to a literary text. What an act of pleasure this is, and an act of pleasure that has to be shared with other people, because there's no pleasure in arranging these clues in your own head. The great pleasure comes from telling another person, I saw this here, do you also see it? And I followed it here, and does that make sense? And what can we create together? And in that sense, you and your group end up being a little bit like Marco Polo and Kublai Khan. Only the objects in front of you are not, you know, fish baskets and precious stones (laughs) or whatever it is that he's gesturing with, but it's this book, it's Invisible Cities that is allowing you to do that work of imaginative co-creation. But I think also because there's this utopianism it's not just, um, and I'm forgetting who it is. There's some critic I read who, it's not just about leading you into the labyrinth for the sake of the labyrinth, but he wants to lead you out. And yeah. the the city that we finally found, which was a thin city from his maybe <laughs> tip that he gave us, um, was on page 35, Zenobia, mm. where he says, it makes no sense to divide cities into unhappy cities or happy cities but rather into another two. Those that through the years and the changes continue to give form to their desires and those in which desires either erase the city or are erased by it. That's nice. That reminds me a little bit of my reading of If on a Winter's Night, Yes, A Traveler, which is that on the one hand, you have books that seem to standardize and dull readers' desires, I think I write. And on the other hand, you have books that seem to mutate according to the reader's (laughs) predictable 
desires. And that would seem to map nicely onto the two kinds of cities that he's describing here at the end of Zenobia. Well, I have to tell you, too, because you also say in your essay, which I think is part of what we're getting at here, that despite the otherworldliness of the story, I'm quoting from you, its characters live somehow close to you in a Calvino book. Mm. And my little sidestep here, too, is I, I read your annotated Mrs. Dalloway. It Thank was you. wonderful. And, you know, I'd read the novel several times, but I had such a strange experience because you point to how Virginia Woolf uses character as a sort of common meeting place. Mm -hmm. And that by the end of the novel, I'm summarizing quickly here, but Clarissa Dalloway is sort of out of the picture for much of the last 30 pages or so. But at the very end, she returns. And you write in your last note, the novel's final words sum up Wolf's commitment to her character's irreducibility, her singularity. In inviting the reader to ponder where precisely Clarissa is, the only definite place we can point to is the novel. I had the strangest experience. I'd read Dalloway several times. I finished your Dalloway and I started wandering around my neighborhood in Chicago in and out of stores. I swear no one talked to me. I had completely disappeared and mm. only Mrs. Dalloway existed. <laughs> now, this is di but with Calvino, I think he disappears and you are the only person who exists, the reader. Oh, that's so interesting. That is so interesting. I mean, I think that that is, that is in many ways the great generosity of the second person address, the willingness to disappear at the end. Because whereas Wolf ends with, you know, Wolf ends with Peter thinking, and there she was. Right, so Wolf ends with her creation, and there she was. Where was she? Well, here she is. She's only in the novel, <laughs> and Calvino ends with the you, right? Such that by the end of the novel, you've had the experience of the novel, but you don't feel as if you have been lost to it exactly, or you don't feel like that experience exists in some realm that you can't touch or that you can't also live in. Mm. And to me, that is the unbelievably generous aspect of his, of his fiction. Actually, what I was thinking about, I don't know if you've read it, but the the writer or the novel that I often think about if on a winter's night a traveler in comparison to is Ian McEwan's Atonement. Oh yeah. The end of Ian McEwan's Atonement, where the metafictional gimmick becomes clear and it feels unbelievably cruel because you have been essentially banished or exiled from the world of the novel in the same way that Robbie is banished or exiled from the home of the woman that he loves. And there's nothing you can do about it. And something about that feels very painful to a reader. You feel cheated, you feel upset, you feel like you've been treated badly. Calvino is the exact opposite of that. I think right. he's too eager to be loved by his readers and so desirous of wanting them to know that he loves them, that he would never betray you or treat you cruelly like that. And I joke a little bit at the end of my essay about how the end of If on a Winter's Night, a traveler seems to give us this perfect husband, this perfect <laughs> setup. But of course, there's always a little, a little wrinkle in that. I, a little wrinkle in that, which is if that perfect husband were tempted by the voice of this you in the bookstore, what would he do? I love that. So let, let's talk about If on a Winter's Night, a Traveler now, because... Sorry, um, we, I keep coming back to it. As I, a, well, we have to. Yes, it's right, it's central, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, I, I, it is, you know, his masterpiece. It is just stunning. I think, you know, it connects to that description of Zenobia mm. and... Also, in the title essay of that new collection, The Written World and the Unwritten World, he talks about, well, you know, a master writer 
Um, this is near the end of the essay. The, the secret is in knowing how to keep the force of desire intact. And that's what he's doing. So we have this novel where you start to read a book called If on a Winter's Night, A Traveler, and then something's wrong with the book. It keeps repeating. So you go back to the bookstore. There's alternating chapters that are within the realm of the fictional and then the reader, who is you, Mm -hmm. um, trying to find these new things. Well, then it turns out they give you the wrong book. So then your desires are thwarted again. But you keep getting so involved in the story that that force of desire has to keep remaining intact. It keeps drawing you forward. No, it's wonderful. It's it's wonderful. And I think that what's incredible is the way that desire begins in an incredibly kind of specific way, right? You want to read this particular book. You, the reader who are being addressed, want to read this particular book, if on a winter's night, a traveler. And then when you go back to the bookstore to exchange the book for another one, you meet a woman, you meet Ludmilla, who becomes the other reader. And then all of a sudden, your desire starts to split, which is that you want to read this book, but you also want to know something about this woman. And then you start reading the next book, and you can't read that, and your desire splits even more. And then you pursue Ludmilla a little bit, and you meet her sister, Lotaria. And your desire splits again. And so it becomes this wonderful, what begins as a sort of single desire branches out very, very quickly into this amazing multiplicity of desires for different books, for different kinds of experiences in the world, for different women who all sort of resemble one another but can't be reduced to one another. And I think that that explosion or the creation of this kind of force field of want and need and lack is what keeps you reading that novel ravenously, truly ravenously. Yeah. Your description of it, right, was that you took it back and you couldn't stop reading until 3 a.m. Yeah. That was very much my experience of it too. And I think most people that you speak to who had that kind of early, early compulsive reading experience with Calvino would testify to something very similar. But what's wonderful is that like, yes, on the one hand, it's about you, the reader. On the other hand, that is entirely engineered or orchestrated by the form of the novel itself. So it's always both. It's always something about the object and the shape that it takes, its arrangement, and something about you, the reader, and the very, I think, universal desires that are being activated by that form. So it's always going back and forth. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, in the sake of time, I'll ask you my final question here. Okay. So you've written a lot about good and bad readings at various institutions. Um, Calvino sort of pokes fun a little bit at university reading sometimes. But you also had this recent New Yorker piece about John Guillory's new book, Professing Criticism, and the state of literary studies or criticism today. So I'm going to quote from you here. You say, it is not clear that even the most robust justifications for literary study would be effective in the face of overwhelming socioeconomic pressures, the rise of new media, and the decline of prose fiction as a genre of entertainment. Yeah. Whatever the case may be, the hard truth is that no reader needs literary works interpreted for her, certainly not in the professionalized language of the literary scholar. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we can find all these narratives of decline whether it's the market logic um, infecting everything, every institution, or a lot of book and curriculum bans. Calvino at one point says, nobody these days holds the written word in such high esteem as police states do. Yeah. So as I was reading your work and Calvino at the same time, I had this wild and probably naive thought, <laughs> <laughs> can Calvino's utopia help us here? And not just because reading him will make you fall in love with reading so much that you'll become the most promiscuous reader ever, always searching for a new form to desire, but also because his vision is a world where everyone is a self-appointed reader. By the end of If on a Winter's Night, a Traveler, 
you get this scene where he enters a library and he says, what harbor can receive you more surely than a great library? And then all these other new other readers pop up and say, well, this is what I look for in a book and this is how I read. And actually, I read this differently. Um, and I just thought, you know, you it's, it's, it is a wild, naive thought, but um, what do you make of all this? I don't think it's naive. I don't think it's naive at all. I mean, the, the essay that you quote from, the essay on John Guillory's book, Professing Criticism, ends with the Marxist thought experiment that John stages at the end of his previous book, Cultural Capital. And without getting into the ins and outs of that experiment, it's real takeaway or its utopian vision is that everyone should have access to the means of education that would allow them to be a reader and different kinds of readers. The same way I think everyone should have access to the means of education and the economic means by which they could be a critic. And I think that if that were possible, if that utopia were actualized, one of the things I say, and this is, I think, similar to Calvino, although I hadn't made the connection, so thank you for making it. One of the things I say is that a lot of the distinctions that we erect, a lot of the cultural distinctions we erect today would simply cease to be relevant, or they wouldn't be so inflected by economic concerns. And we could see the purview of criticism and of literature really expanding dramatically. I, I, to me, that, that really has to be the future. And I know that this is probably controversial for some people, but I increasingly think that the right thing for professional literary critics to do is to find out how to, or figure out how to work across the educational system so with high schools, middle schools, elementary schools, with professional schools, with adult education, community education programs, prison literacy initiatives, and to work across the cultural system with libraries, with booksellers, uh, with all of the people that help bring culture, help bring literature into people's hands. Because there's no point anymore, if there ever was a point, which I don't know that there was, there's really no point anymore, I think, in doubling down on highly professionalized forms of expertise. I think getting in touch with the literary desires of people who are not professionalized literary critics is so important. And I'm not saying the same way I don't think you're saying that that's all of a sudden going to fix the socioeconomic or the political situation that we're in. But I think when I when I try to think about what it is that we can do to enact some sort of change, however incremental it might be, that seems to me the most viable way forward. Well, John Guillory says at the end of Cultural Capital, the point is not to make judgment disappear, but to reform the conditions of its practice. And um, I just have That's to say- correct. That's very correct. Yeah. I really do. I really do. Yeah. And for me, reading you and reading Calvino together helped me put words to what I do here at the well, library. So I I'm really so want to thank you for that. No, thank you. And I'm so happy that you invited me on. And I'm so grateful for what you're doing because, you know, having having the Calvino reading group, <laughs> thinking about these books together, talking about them with me, us having this conversation. I mean, this is how literary culture continues to exist. This is how it continues to be lived. Uh, and I think that, as I said in the piece, conversation is a sensuous and an intellectual necessity at a time when fewer and fewer people care about the words on the page. And this has been an occasion to have that sort of conversation for, for me. So thank you so much. You can find out more about Merve Emray at her website, merveemray.com. And she's on Twitter at Mervatum. 
You can check out books by Merve and Italo Calvino here at the library featured in our podcast collection, our classics book discussion collection, and our regular collection. Recent issues of The New Yorker, physical copies at the library and online through Libby are also available. Links to everything we talked about will be in the blog post and show notes. That's our show. Thank you so much to Merve for taking the time to talk with us. And thank you for listening to our 58th interview episode. Each month or so, we release an interview with a notable author or artist from our own Chicagoland or around the world. Comments and feedback are always welcome and can be sent to podcast at deerfieldlibrary.org. Go to deerfieldlibrary.org slash podcast to learn more about the show and find links to subscribe. You can also follow the library on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or check out our YouTube channel. Links are on our website or in our show notes. We'll be back next month. Thanks for listening.